awesome, awesome music. And the stars sing together, the scripture says, in the creation. You believe that? That means, I think, about the greatest thing you can do in the presence of God is make music, yeah. not become a theologian. <laughs> God, don't, don't try to be profound in the presence of God. Don't try to be right in the presence of God. Just be thankful <laughs> <laughs> and sing a love song. In moments like these, I lift up my voice. I lift up my hands unto Jesus. In moments like thee, I lift up a song. I lift up a song unto Him. Singing, I love you, Lord. Singing, I Simon, who authored that song, by the way, there that bright morning when the Lord looked at him and said, Simon, do you, uh, do you have it all straight yet, son? Do you love me more than all these others? And Simon said, I, I believe I do. <laughs> that sounds good to me, Lord. Well, Simon, in that case, I want to ask you again. Do you love me more than all these? <laughs> Probably pointed to a couple of empty boats and empty nets. <laughs> Simon's nets were always empty. The boy never caught the fish. <laughs> Yet had a title that said, Big Fisherman on the Boat. In the light of your failures, do you, do you love me? Jesus said, hey, Simon. He didn't say Simon Rocky. He said, Simon, son of John. Simon, son of John, you who you are in your root system, do you love me? Oh, sure, you can love me when you've been religious and stained glass windows. <laughs> but when you're out there and fished all night, oh, excuse me, worked all night and didn't catch any fish. <laughs> There's a difference in going fishing and going working. If making love is a bore to you, you're in trouble. If fishing is a job, you're in trouble. Some things are for joy in life, not for work. Loving is one of those, and fishing is a sucker one. <laughs> Simon, you got no fish in the net, and everybody's laughing at you. Do you still love me? Isn't it, isn't it amazing that Jesus said to those disciples, one thing I have to ask of you, just one thing I want to ask of you, don't be ashamed of me. That's unbelievable. That should have been their request. Lord, we just got one thing to ask of you. Please don't be ashamed of us. But he says that. Why would he say that? Because he knows we're ashamed of him. We blush to speak his name, the hymn writer said. That's why we hide out in our stained glass sanctuaries. I was uh, a part of a Pastors We Care mission, and uh, it was where a group of clergy were invited to a local church, and we had about 20 clergy invited to this church in Hampton Roads, Virginia, and we were to have three days of, uh, of worship and, and Bible teaching and going out to knock on doors. And, and all of us clergy folk were there, and the leader of the mission was explaining to us you will be assigned to a lay person, and the two of you will go knocking on door to door, asking the question, could you tell us what you know about Jesus? <laughs> and my roommate left a note on the table, a fellow clergyman, that said, I had a, I had a death in my parish, I've got to go home. And uh, 
a couple of months later, I saw him, and I said, I'm sorry you had to leave our Ministers We Care mission. By the way, who died? He said, I did. <laughs> when they said, you've got to knock on doors and say to somebody, do you love Jesus? Can you tell me about Jesus? I just died on the inside. I could never do that. That's why Jesus says, don't be ashamed of me. Why? Because that's the last one of whom we should be ashamed. And yet often he's the first one we will hush. See, don't want to offend anybody. <laughs> that's our excuse for not witnessing to the neighbor next door. Been living there 20 years. We haven't spoken Jesus to them yet. Yeah. Oh, well, I can see I am. <laughs> I've got off the CFO comfortable jag and got on something pestering some of you. <laughs> Isn't it amazing that we think we can fit God into our comfort zone? Want everybody to be comfortable. I'm a part of a church, United Methodist Church. I can talk about my church, and don't you talk about it. <laughs> our aim is to please everybody. We actually hired a secular firm to do a poll and sent them out. And the question was, what do you people think about United Methodists? And we, we did now. I, I granted this was an agency in Nashville, and, and they're out of touch with everything. But they, <laughs> they asked this secular firm to go down the streets of America and say to people, what do you think about the people called United Methodists? The overwhelming response was, who are they? <laughs> Don't know anything about you. Boy, isn't that a wake-up call? Why? Because we're ashamed of him. In a minister's meeting in Richmond, Virginia, we had one rabbi came his day to speak to the minister's group. He stood and said, Brothers, I want to ask a favor of you. Would you please talk to me about your Jesus? He said, I've been in one of your group now for years. Not a one of you have ever talked to me about your Jesus. You want to talk politics. You want to talk theology. You want to talk sociology. And all of that, my, my, my kind is better than yours. You can't improve on what I got. But the one thing you have to talk to me about is your Jesus. And you never talk about him. I'd like to hear about him, the rabbi said. <laughs> We were in San Francisco, 1973, my first time of going to a Congress on Evangelism. And we were being picketed, United Methodist Church was being picketed by young Israelis, young Jewish people. They had signs that said, Methodist anti-Semitic. Now, of course, we know we're not. We love everybody. <laughs> you understand? And so we invited them in to, to tell us, why would you say we're anti-Semitic? So they simply said, we have a question for you. Do you believe in missions? Well, of course we believe in missions. We have missionaries all over America, all over the world. How many do you have in Israel? How many have you ever sent to the Jews? Not one. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? And so, uh, questions are a dangerous thing, aren't they? Someone said, the people you allow to shape your questions will shape your destiny. Do you love me, Jesus said. Jesus has more questions than he has answers, by the way. You, you come into Jesus as your answer man, you can forget about it. He's not your answer man. He ain't got all the answers to our problems. Once he's God, he's got a whole new agenda of problems. <laughs> the ones you thought were primary become insignificant. And you have a new set of problems. New agenda. And that's awesome. But you see, his agenda will lead us to God. Our agenda will lead us to confusion. Just mark it down. This is the hallmark of our world today, of our nation, is confusion. In every area of our life, check it out. 
Everything's up for a vote. We ain't sure what's true. <laughs> See? And uh, that's because we have our own agenda. And in this nation, we have, de we have determined that God shall not be in charge. And we vote for them every four years. And they all say the same thing. See? And so we, 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 we're just a part of the system. See? And, uh, and so the question is, do you love me? Hey, church, do, you, do we love our Lord? Uh, are we identified with him? Oh, Paul said, we, we'd like to be in his resurrection, not too sure about his sufferings. <laughs> well, uh, those are some things I hadn't planned to say. <laughs> They're usually the best part. <laughs> uh, God is the giver of good gifts, and he delights to give to his children, Jesus said. One of my daughters came to me uh, some years ago and said, Daddy, uh, I, I, I have this, this feeling uh, about me that something terrible is going to happen. It's just like a cloud over my head when I awaken in the morning. And uh, I, it's a feeling of dread and uh, anxiety about life, no particular area of life, just, just life in general. And I, I just feel like something terrible is going to happen. And, uh, and she said, I, I want you to pray about that and let me know what you hear. And I did, and, and I did. <laughs> I said, my understanding is that you as a child of God are functioning in a place in society that is uh, the arena of darkness. And though you are there as a child of God, for you felt called to be there, the fallout of that is it casts a shadow over you. For death is a primary shadow. Yea, though I walk through the shadow of death. And, uh, and so I said to her that, that death uh, which is of, uh, of esteem authority in our society is welding itself, its nature over you, though you are a child of God. And at some point, you're going to have to cut the lines, redraw the lines, so that death knows it has no claim on you. that you are immune uh, to its presence, to its seed. Now, what my daughter was, she was a nurse in delivery and abortion. And she said, in this uh, room, we would be trying to save a child that was uh, 30, 60 days uh, younger than one we were aborting in the other room. And the ones that you abort, you hold in your hand and feel the heartbeat and put them in the sack and pour in the chemical and put them on the shelf like five pounds of sugar. And she was there at University of Virginia, Mr. Jefferson's University, and he's up there on Monticello Hill. They call it a mountain. It's only probably uh, 1,500 feet high, but they call it Monticello Mountain. And there he is buried in his grave and his marker, and there's his university, the university. They don't even call it University of Virginia, they just call it the university. <laughs> they don't think there's another one in the whole cosmos except that one. <laughs> and I live down the road from Monticello, so I know what I'm talking about. One morning I'm driving Teresa to University of Virginia Hospital, and I look over to the right, and there are uh, uh, clouds of smoke just rolling up from the foot of the mountain down from where Mr. Jefferson is buried. And Teresa saw me looking at the smoke and she said, Dad, do you know what that smoke is? I said, no, I do not. She said, that's from the, from the place where we uh, furnish the fetuses aboard at the university. 
So at the foot of Monticello Mountain, the father of the Constitution, I believe, and certain inalienable rights, the university burns the carcasses of the babies that are boarded in the hospital, and hell clicks its heels together. For all this stuff about life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness is a pipe dream. We don't even believe it. Why? Because we don't love God. We love ourselves. And until we get honest about this, the power of Calvary and resurrection will not be ours. Demons will laugh in your face at your pretty prayers. So help me, they will. And uh, I don't know how many years I have left, but God said to me some time ago, I want you available. And my understanding was I'm not to be available just to go out and make pretty talks. I'm at a place in my life when I've got to get on with God's agenda. I don't know where you are, but that's a joyful thing that you don't understand now. That's where it's at, folks. That's where life is. That's where joy is as we're walking in his purposes for our lives. And I just want to share a little bit of that with you, how it's been realized in my own life. You see, uh, we're each experts in our own arena. And would you believe it that the scripture says, you tell what you have seen and heard. Said that to Saul. God's chosen you to know his will. Hey, brother Saul, calls him brother. <laughs> I mean, he's only his biggest enemy. The guy just came to the territory to do him in. And uh, he had a sunstroke, Saul did. That's what I was taught when I was in college. <laughs> <laughs> Professor said he's out there in the sun with no, nothing on his head. And he fell off his horse and uh, had a sunstroke and heard voices, saw light. <laughs> All I got to say is pray for a sunstroke. That's all I know. <laughs> so this old boy was put in touch with God. First he was brought to his own natural position before God, which was totally helpless. Nothing to recommend him. <laughs> uh, a, a friend of mine, Dr. George Ritchie, uh, in 1942 was sent down to Dallas, Texas to go to boot camp. And when he finished boot camp, they were going to send him to med school at the University uh, in Richmond there at the medical college. And George is in boot camp and develops a high fever. And they put him in the hospital. And his agenda was, man, I got to get out of here and catch the train after tomorrow to go to Richmond and go to med school. The doctor's agenda was, boy, you're not leaving the bed. You, you've got unbelievable fever, and we don't know what's causing it. So George decided that night when the medical staff was gone and basically off duty and just had a duty nurse, he's going to slip out the side door and go down and catch the train the next morning. And so he wakes up in the middle of the night and looks at his watch, and he's almost late, so he rushes over to his closet to get his clothes and turns around and sees his body on his bed. He's out of his body. He's dead. <laughs> could not get back into his body. Went out in the hall and could not make contact with any body there. Just he's out of his body. He's on his way. <laughs> and then suddenly he's in a journey. He's traveling. He's up over the earth. He said, I could see the cities and people. And at one point he saw millions of teenagers and their faces. And it's like they were caught in a prison of darkness. And then suddenly, he's before this intense blue light, which he knew to be Jesus. George was not overly religious. He's probably a good Methodist or Baptist. Uh, <laughs> but now he's before the light, and the light just says to him, what do you want? And George cries out, Jesus, I want to live. I've got to go and be a doctor. So I want to live. And the question came back, George said, there were no words, there was just perception. 
What did you do with the life I gave you? Sir George Richard said, I tried to think of something worthwhile I could say to the giver of life to justify my being. He said, all I could think of was, I blurted out, I was an Eagle Scout. <laughs> I never was that. I barely made tenderfoot. <laughs> and, the, and the Lord said, is that all? And he said, I helped an old woman across the street one time. And he said, anything else you want to say? George said, I'm too young to die. The answer came back, no one is too young to die. The mortician came for his body, put it in the body bag, took it out to the hearse and put it in the back of the vehicle. And as they threw it in, he groaned and they zipped it open and George was alive. Went on to university and became a doctor. And I met him when I went to be a part of the staff of the Bishop Church in Richmond, 1959. He, he was a part of the clinic there. We had a clinic, pastoral clinic. He was uh, then a pediatrician, was a pediatrician to my children. Uh, later went on to become a child psychiatrist, and that's what he is today in Eastern Virginia. But he found himself before God, never intended to arrive there, and a question was asked, what did you do with the life I gave you? There's a hymn we used to sing when I was a boy, work for the night is coming. Work through the morning hours. Work. Da, 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 something about noonday. La da 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 da. La da 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 da. La da 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 da. da. Work for the night is coming when man's work is done. So we don't sing that anymore because we don't believe in work anymore. <laughs> oh, my. But the point that God wants to make for us is teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. That's simply saying, don't miss it. It's all around you. It's already on your tongue. Speak it. The word of faith. Hey, Jesus said, the kingdom of God is within you. Not low here and low there. Not at CFO up there in Wisconsin or Minnesota or Atlanta. It's within you. And it's the Father's pleasure to give it to you, he said. Somehow I was taught, if not taught, I caught it <laughs> from where I worshiped when I grew up, that God had a lot of things to give, but he was a stingy giver. Did you ever get that impression? He, he might give you a little bit, but now, I throw off. I mean, I, I remember folks saying at Christmas time when they fix fruit baskets and gifts. Now, you, we want to make sure they're worthy. Now, let's find out if they're getting some from the Baptist. If they are, we don't want to give them nothing. <laughs> and that's how we Christians give. We don't want you to get spoiled now. Tell you right now, you're going to spoil that child loving it like that. Why? Because that's how we saw God. He might forgive you this time, but one more, honey, and he's going to let you have it. <laughs> See? To illustrate that, uh, taking a group to Israel back in the 80s, and a beautiful family, a mother and two daughters from California, signed up to go with me. And uh, we had made the journey over to Israel and uh, from New York and we're in uh, Israel and going up Masada. And I look at the mother of these two daughters and she is ashen. And she's literally shaken from her head to her feet and holding on to the center pole there in the cable car. You go up about 3,000 feet or something like that, uh, straight up to the mountain. And she was terrified. And I saw it and I stepped over, put my hand on her hand and just began to speak the word of God to her. By the time we got to the top, she had regained her composure a little bit. And we have to walk up maybe a hundred steps up the side of a cliff. So I put her on the inside, you know, big brave Earl. <laughs> and, uh, 
and, and, and just looked her way. Uh, I'm not anxious to look over the edge myself. But, and I got her to the top, and she went off to sit on a rock while we did the, the tour, and when we got back, she was fine. She said, I, I, I'm all right, Brother Earl, I, I, I'm gonna be all right. And she was, went on down the cable car, and she had no problems. Finished our time in Israel, came back by Switzerland, and we are at Lucerne and in this beautiful hotel and, uh, and a magnificent dining room. Must be looked something like the White House does uh, when you're especially invited to come spend the night. And, uh, <laughs> and we were there and we're waiting for the group to get there. There were chandeliers everywhere, you know, and uh, waiters with the linen napkin over their arm. And uh, I mean, just fantastic. And the daughters come and say, our mother is upstairs on the floor. Her back has gone out. She says she'll not be able to finish the tour. She'll have to go to the hospital and they'll have to put weights on her for that's the only thing they can do. And periodically, they said her back goes out and she has to go to the hospital for a week. So I go upstairs to her room and there she is lying in the middle of the floor. And she tells me her diagnosis. <laughs> and says, Brother, are you all going to have supper? I, I'll, I'll have to get a medical person here at the hotel. I said, well, before I go, would you like me to pray for you? And she said, yes, that would be nice. So uh, I, I prayed for her, gave thanks for healing, and uh, walked out. Uh, Fifteen minutes later, she walked down the steps and joined us at the table. Back just fine. Finished our trip, she went back to California. A couple of months later, I got a letter. Dear Brother Earl, I have got to be honest with you. When you were here in California and we decided to go with you to Israel, we were all happy, but I was especially delighted when I discovered that we would leave from New York because I used to live in New York and back in New York was an old sweetheart of mine I had not seen in 25 years and I felt this would be a time for us to have a reunion. My intention was just to call him and chat with him over the phone. But once I got to New York and we got on the phone, I said, would you have supper with me? And so we had supper. I sent my daughters to some uh, theaters and my old boyfriend and I had supper. And when we finished supper, he said, would you like to go to my room? And I said, yes, I would. And I went up and got in bed with him. And she said, uh, as I was going up the cable car to uh, that mountain, I felt as naked as the mountain and felt like everybody knew my sin and that God especially was going to make that cable car drop and kill us all because of my sin. And she said, then you had to come and begin to pray for me. And uh, I got all right. And, and then I thought, well, that takes care of that. Then she said, we got to Switzerland. And I was so excited about this grand hotel. And as I was dressing, my back suddenly popped and I fell to the floor. And I said to God, so this is the way you're going to punish me. <laughs> and then she said, you had to come upstairs and pray for me. And I got healed. <laughs> And she said, what I've got to be honest about is, after God doing all that, when we landed back in New York, I called my friend and spent another night with him. And now I've been home for two months and I'm waiting for the ax to fall. So I called her. I said, I got news for you. You'll wait a long time before the ax falls on you. God is not that impressed with your sin. And you think God's going, hold everything like a yonder. What are we going to do? Well, where's my axe? Where's my favorite cutting axe? One that George cut down the church tree with. That's the one I want. I'm going to chop her roots right off of her toes. You think that's God's response to sin? My brother Tommy says, some people take the Bible literally. Others take it seriously. <laughs> So if you take it seriously, hear this. 
God was in Christ reconciling sinners unto himself. He has dealt with sin once and for all. No more sacrifice or punishment for sin. Now there are natural consequences to sin's lifestyle. It ain't good for you. The guilt alone will kill you. <laughs> I mean, just dismiss all the other things that could happen. <laughs> like your name on the front page. <laughs> on everybody's phone in town kind of thing. But just, apart from that, God has dealt with sin. And you don't have to run around afraid that God's actually going to fall on you. Because at Calvary, God took your iniquity. That's your nature, not your deeds. He who knew no sin, Paul says, 2 Corinthians 5, 20, became sin, iniquity, nature. Didn't say sins, became sin, the principle of sin. He became that. So when you look at Jesus on the cross, you're looking at what you is, <laughs> sin. You understand? He takes your nature, your being, and nails it to the cross. Okay. Why? So that it cannot turn and put its penalty on you. The, what is that principle? It is the innocent suffering for the guilty. That's what you call forgiveness. What is forgiveness? We talk a lot about forgiveness. Is forgiveness said, oh, well, I'll try to readjust my attitude. I, I, you know, I, I'll fit that somewhere into my psychological uh, 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 closet, along with all the other junk, and just learn to live with it. I was at CFO. Uh, and they came running and said, there, 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 there's a woman over here ready to kill herself. Somebody better come. <laughs> so two or three of us made a dash across the grounds and went into her room. And there she sat on the floor. No, she's sitting on the bed. But she was doing like this on the, on the rug, looking for something. But death all over her. I had not met her, though she'd been there almost 24 hours at camp, but had not attended any sessions. And, but I saw the spirit of death over her, and, and she's down here doing this. So I just say to her to get her attention, you've decided you want to die, have you? She just looked up and said, yes, and went back looking around the carpet. I said, why, why would you make that decision? She just looked up and said, because I'm a 40-year-old slut, that's why, and went back. I said, what are you searching for? She said, I'm searching for a contact lens. I said, well, where did you lose it? She said, somewhere in this room. I said, well, have you prayed about it? Are you one of those people who pray over parking places? Lord, thank you for a parking place. You know I've got to be there on time. I mean, the world thinks you're crazy, darling, but you keep on praying. <laughs> if you lose a contact lens, keep on praying. I said, uh, the Lord's concerned. How much did that thing cost? She said, I don't know, $200. I said, the Bible says he's concerned about a sparrow. That's about two pennies who falls out of the nest. And you're talking about $200. Alone, God is a good manager of money. He don't want that to go down the tube. He'll help us find your contact lens. She just said, you're crazy. So I just fell on my knees. I'd never seen a contact lens. I imagine they look something like a fish scale. <laughs> I didn't know what they looked like. I just said, Jesus, would you show me that contact lens? She's sitting on the bed now and she's laughing. She said, you fool, you ain't got any sense. I said, Jesus, would you show me the contact lens? Well, look a yonder. <laughs> I just raked it into the palm of my hand and I said, look her there. And she just took a sigh, <gasps> a gasp and said, 
maybe you're not crazy. And I handed the lens and she put it in her eye. Then I sat down beside her and just reassured her of the Lord's love and got up and left. Next morning, she's at breakfast and she said, Brother Earl, <clears throat> I'm not all the way there yet, but I want you to know that I've made the turn. <laughs> and it was the contact lens. You see, darkness comes to say, God doesn't really love you. He's not involved in your life, in your routines. Aha, but he is. His name is Emmanuel, God with us. His name is indwelling one, comforter, Holy Spirit, who will not leave you as an orphan. Ever feel like an orphan? And on the cross, he dealt with that death, with that barren spirit, with that evil unbelief. Do you know a whole generation of God's children died in the wilderness over unbelief? Not AIDS, not adultery, not murder, not mayhem, unbelief. We glory in it. <laughs> we appoint committees to make study to hold up our unbelief. That is, we just don't believe what God says, so we appoint a committee to make sure it's true. We have scholars, uh, 500 scholars did a study of the Gospel of John. This was a couple of years ago they issued their report. 500 scholars spent, I don't know how many years, doing a study of the Gospel of John to determine how much of the Gospel of John is authentic. Well now, you know, right off, I'd like to ask, well, who appointed the committee and for what purpose? Why do you want to know what part is authentic or what is not authentic? <laughs> is it that you want to be sure what is God's word so you can obey that? But that's not what they said. They completed their report and they made their announcement national TV and color coded it. Decided something like 40% uh, of John was not authentic. But nobody said, now the 60% we're determined to walk in. Because <laughs> I got a feeling if just one sentence is authentic and you stand on that, you enter the kingdom. You know the power of the kingdom within you. But you see, we are a generation who will not stand anywhere unless there's an exit door tomorrow. That's us. And you, you can look at me like you, you know, honey, that's us. We haven't suffered yet. None of us been through the fire yet. Understand? Where the enemy says, denounce him or die. How many of you think be left in this nation? Someone said, why aren't Christians in America put in jail? The answer was, because Christians in America doesn't threaten Caesar. You begin to threaten Caesar, you'll wind up in jail. A nurse in a, who was a nurse in a hospital in Florida pulled a plug on a suction machine. She spent two years in prison. All she did was to pull a plug on a suction machine. But that's coming against Caesar because Caesar has decreed it's your right. See? But you see, we Christians don't believe in coming against Caesar. We don't even believe in coming against the darkness. <laughs> the Bible says he gives us the power to call forth angels and to cast out demons. And so help me, most of the places I run in, this, <laughs> in our society, we bind angels and loose demons. But what we give our bless, blessing to, or we remain silent about. And the heart of God is crying out to his people. In our day, you're not going to, you're not going to make it easy into the kingdom, brothers and sisters. Going to come a time when you're going to cut bait or fish. 
And I believe that day is here. I really believe it is. And the handwriting's on the wall for institutional religion. It's going down the tube. That's, that's all. That's all. That's all. You know why? Because it asks nothing. If you ask nothing, you give nothing. You've got nothing to give. How can you forgive sin when you say there is no sin? See? How can you pray prayers of healing when you say, but we have hospitals? <laughs> yeah. uh, now, you think, well, Earl, you know, where are you going? Uh, well, let's hear what the scripture says. If you, if you, you got, you got, got scripture with you, uh, not that you have to. Uh, I want to read uh, from Hebrews and the uh, fourth chapter. Uh, just two verses. Hebrews 4, 12, and 13. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. The word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any laser beam, contemporary translation, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. I was invited to go and preach a revival. That's what I do. I'm an evangelist. United Methodist Church, which is my church, I love it dearly. And that, that's, that's why its, it's sins hurt me so deeply. And I can talk about that. Uh, but I was invited to go preach a revival in a little country church. And they said, it's going to be homecoming. And I said, well, I like that. Get dinner on the ground and all that stuff, you know. And, all the old folks come back, and, and you have a great five or six days of uh, uh, early morning breakfast and 10 o'clock Bible study, and then in the afternoon you go visiting the folks, particularly the sickly folk, and, and then at long about 4.30 you go out and have supper in someone's home, and everybody does their favorite cooking because the pastor and the evangelists are here, and man, you just become a glutton and have no guilt about it. You can't hurt, you can't hurt the cook's feeling, you understand. And uh, I was looking forward to that, and, and the pastor said, we're going to have a 7 o'clock breakfast Sunday morning. I said, well, I'm three hours from you. I'll have to get up about 4 o'clock, get started. So I did. Got up about 3.30 and drove down to three hours to his uh, church for a 7 o'clock breakfast and got there and had this marvelous breakfast with the men and... Uh, and their sons, and uh, uh, after that, uh, we had Sunday school, and as Sunday school began, the pastor came and said, Brother Earl, I meant to tell you, the administrative board decided, since this is my first year as their pastor, and it's homecoming, they thought I ought to preach Sunday morning. I said, that's fine. That's, that's, that, that's all right with me. I mean, if you want to put Bay Ruth in the bullpen while you get up and try to get the ball, go ahead, son. <laughs> I mean, that's what I really thought. I mean, uh, why would you bring this great world evangelist down here if you going to let me sit a warm a pew? But uh, I tried to be gracious. <laughs> and the young man did good. He, he really did. He, he did fine. So uh, after that, we had dinner on the grounds. And, uh, uh, and then after dinner on the grounds, we had uh, uh, quartets come in all Sunday afternoon, hymn sing. 
And that got over about five o'clock. And the pastor gets up and says, uh, some of the folks have said they're too tired to come back tonight, so we'll cancel the night services. We'll see you in the morning at seven o'clock breakfast. By that time, I wanted to hit him. <laughs> you know, I could have stayed home, you know, with my wife and grandchildren and driven down Monday morning. But, I, but you know, I, I put that on the back burner. <laughs> So next morning we had the seven o'clock breakfast and then a Bible study. When I finished the Bible study, we started out the door because the pastor said, we want to go to town, we want to have lunch, and we want to see Miss Mary. She's in the hospital, she's in a coma, she's one of our dear saints, and I told her daughters we'd go by to see her. As we walked to the car, the minister's wife walked up beside me. I had not had a chance to really meet her, and she introduced herself and said, Brother Earl, I didn't get a chance to speak to you yesterday but I really appreciated your Bible study this morning. And I think I want to talk with you before the week's over because I was an abused child. I said, I'd be fine. I'd be glad to spend some time talking about anything you want to talk about. We got in the car. I sat in the back seat and she sat in the front and she turned halfway around and we talked all the way to town to the restaurant where we had lunch. And then we came back out at the lunch, go to the hospital and, uh, and we got to the hospital and uh, went up on the third floor in room 312 and walked in and there sat the grandson on the bed of the beautiful grandma who was in a coma, had been for two weeks. They couldn't find out what the problem was. He's holding her hand. The two daughters are sitting over here. And when the pastor walks in, they jump up and run and hug him and begin to tell him what the doctors say about the mama. I look at their mama, the grandma, and she is a beautiful saint of God, but uh, w once uh, three times in my life, the Lord let me see what was not seeable. The coma was because she was terrified of dying and she's hiding in a cave. They call it a coma. And the Lord just let me see that. I knew exactly what it was, therefore I knew exactly how to pray. We visited about five, 10 minutes and then the pastor said, well, we're going to run on. And he said, would you like to have us prayer? And they said, yes, would you please? He turned to me and said, Brother Earl, would you have a prayer? I said, sure will. Why don't you go around on that side of the bed and take her hand? And I went around this side of the bed and took one hand. And I said to him, just lay your right hand on her head. And we laid our hands on her head. And I just said, Sister Mary, the Lord says you don't have to be afraid. His perfect love cast out all fear, Mary. Your family needs you, and you can come on back now. Amen. I turned and walked out the door. He said his goodbyes. I'm halfway down the hall, and he's about 10 feet behind me, when I hear somebody say, I'm hungry! <laughs> and the daughters run out, Mama's awake! Mama's awake! They went running down the hall to the nurse's station. I walk onto the elevator and the pastor comes up and says, Earl, you don't seem to be surprised. I said, I'm not surprised, I'm just thankful. The door opens, we get on the elevator. He says, honey, and there came honey around the corner and she was a frightened deer. And I knew the fear I saw in her eyes. It's the fear that comes to wounded people when God lets them know, here's a human being who can help you. The darkness will say to the victim, you better watch out for that person. They're crazy. They'll kill you. And that, and that victim will begin to have nightmares of this person who is God's agent trying to kill them. Betty and I have seen it over and over and over again in wounded human beings. So I knew the nature of her fear. And she came and got in the elevator. We went down and got in the car. And she said, Brother Earl, you sit up front. So I got up front and she hides out in the corner behind me. Riding into town, she's turning around talking to me. Going back, she never says a word. We get to the parsonage and the pastor says, uh, I've got to go do some visiting. I'll be back in about an hour. He drives off and just leaves his wife and I standing there in the driveway. And she says, well, I guess I got to talk to you. I said, oh, no, you don't either. You don't have to say a word to me about anything. If you'd like to talk, I'll be glad for us to, to share something. But you don't have to talk. She says, I need to talk. 
I said, okay, let's walk over to the sanctuary. Church was right across the little pasture there. We walked into the sanctuary, went up and sat on the, on the front pew. And uh, so as we sat there, I just said to her, what's the nature of your darkness? And she says, it's hate. And I said, uh, directed at any particular person? And she said, yes, at my daddy who abused me all my life. And uh, I said to her, uh, you haven't been able to find peace about that or he's never asked your forgiveness. And she said, he's been dead five years and I still have nightmares about him. And I've decided that I'm going back to our home church and tell everybody what a rascal he was. I said, you can do that, but the nightmares won't go away. Gossip does not make nightmares go away. Confession might. I said, you can do that, but that's not God's way. Uh, she said, well, what is God's way? I said, God's way is to find forgiveness in your own heart for your father and appropriate that forgiveness. She said, but he's dead. I said, that has nothing to do with it. You can make peace with God and with your father if you will ask Jesus to give you the gift of love. What kind of love, she said. I said, Calvary love. Got nothing to do with mother, father, uh, uh, father and daughter. It's got to do with the love of God at Calvary where you forgive your enemies. You die for those who despitefully use you. That, that's the kind of love that casts out fear, not parental love. And I said, what you've got to do, you've got to let go of the hate. You were talking about uh, uh, the closets cleaning out. I call it the dung gate. You just need to use the dung gate. Some things ought to be jettisoned. And death is one of them. Hate is one of them. And I said, what you need to do is to ask Jesus to take the hate out of your belly. Because you see, you can't take it out. It's like getting a fish hook in a bass's mouth. The bass just can't get it out. It's got a little gig on it. Once he swallows it, it digs in. And the more he tries to break free, the more it digs in. And I said, hate is that way. But the Holy Spirit can go down in your belly and work that hook out and pull it up by the roots, up out of your belly. If you will give it to Jesus and ask him to take it, and to cleanse you from the hate. So I said, the question is, are you willing to loose the hate to let it go? She just looked at the floor and said, well, I never thought it would be hard to let go of hate. I said, yes, it's your old friend. Hello, darkness, my old friend. Well, we used to sing songs to it. See, darkness has its place in our lives. It's a friend. Death, suicide is a friend. Come on in. Been looking for you. Sickness. My mama died with you. I guess my time has come. Come on in. Runs in the family, you know. So I said, what you've got to do is to renounce that this belongs on you and in you. And then she said, you know, Brother Earl, I, I tried to work my own way. Uh, when I left home, I was 17 because my father hit me with a fly swatter one day and I swore he'd never touch me again. And I moved into town, got me an apartment and a job. And we got a new preacher at our church and I decided what I need to do is marry a preacher. I need to become a holy woman and my problems will be solved. <laughs> so she said, I set my hat to one the preacher and I won him and I married him. And he wanted me to go and be a part of the church activities. And he wanted me to go to the board meeting, administrative board meeting. She said, the first administrative board meeting I went to, the chairman of the board pinched my fanny. I 
I said, that's darkness calling to darkness. In darkness, you see darkness. Respond to darkness. And I said, if you let it go, then in his light, you'll see light. And you'll be free from that. Uh, she said, how do I let it go? I just said, you say, Lord Jesus, I confess this darkness that's been in my belly and I've been holding on to it. And tonight, today, I want to let it go. Would you please take it away? And uh, she spoke those words. And I said, now speak forgiveness to your daddy. Just say, Daddy, in the name of Jesus, I set you free. And she did. Spoke it. I said, your mama know about that? Yes. I said, speak it to your mama. Set her free. She spoke to her mama. I said, anybody else you need to forgive? Anything else you need to lay on the altar? One or two more things she laid there. I said, all right. Now, I want you to say, Jesus, all of this I put beneath your blood. It was difficult for her to say that. It's amazing how many religious folk don't like to speak about blood. They'll tell you all about theirs, but not about his. <clears throat> Let me tell you about my operation. <laughs> Let me tell you about his operation. <laughs> He took the darkness and nailed it to the cross so he couldn't lay claim to you. And then in turn he says, I set you free. And so she spoke all that. And I reached over and laid my hand on her head and said, in the name of Jesus, I set you free. You're cleansed by his blood. <clears throat> uh, you understand how uh, hemmed in most ministers' wives are? <laughs> Always got to be proper, you know? That, that precious young woman <clears throat> cleared her throat like this and then just like a jack-in-the-box went, Hallelujah! <laughs> and began to skip around the sanctuary. <laughs> skip around the sanctuary. I just sat on the front pew and just watched her. She skipped around. Came back down this aisle and got along about here and just looked at me and our eyes met and I said to her, Yes, you may. She took one step and landed in my lap. <laughs> Put a headlock on my head, and I just wrapped my arms around her. I knew she was a little girl and wanted to sit on her daddy's lap, unafraid. And I just said, Lord, don't let the deacons come in. <laughs> it's all right for a husband to come, but don't let them deacons come in here. I know why Jesus oftentimes put people out of the room when he was going to pray for people, <laughs> because he got intimate with them. And so I just held her, and she held me. I saw her two months later at annual conference. She ran across the floor to meet Betty and I, and she said, is this your wife? I said, yes, it is. This is Betty Jo. This is Linda. She hugged Betty Jo, and she said, I got something to tell you. I waited all my life to meet your husband. What she was saying was, I waited all my life to be set free. And was in church every Sunday. Was in church every Sunday, surrounded by a community of Christians who never knew they could speak the words. I, you can check my credentials out, and it's not, take thou the authority to cast out sin. You understand? That's not one of the things the bishop says when he lays hands on you. We laughingly say, he says, take thou the authority to operate a mimograph machine. <laughs> that was back in the days when I was ordained. <laughs> but that is given to us. And yet we are silent. My wife said one night to me, honey, why is it that the church thinks of itself as the defensive team? Now be honest. When you think of the church, the people of God in America, don't you really think of us as sort of holding the turf that we got? Ain't going to let the darkness in here, bless God. 
<laughs> but that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says you're the offensive team. Jesus said, Simon, I've got something to tell you. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. And hell, the gates of hell shall not stand when you charge them. That's, that's offense. Well, you do have a problem. If I were you, I believe I'd try to find me some good medication and a good psychiatrist. What if you haven't got Blue Cross Blue Shield? <laughs> what if they say, I've tried all that? I was talking with a woman in St. Louis in the airport, and I'm, I'm running to catch a plane, and, and she just told me the darkness had got her by the neck. And I, I said, I, I, I've got a plane. I've got, I got to go. She said, you're not going to leave me like this. I said, no, I'm not going to leave you. Let the plane go. I didn't miss my plane. It took about five minutes to pray for her. And together we agreed we were coming against that root of that thing. Listen, unless you get fed up up to here, you're tolerated. If the Lord appeared at the foot of the bed of your bed tonight and said, you know, that thing's really pestering you, that thing's really been digging on you, I'll take it away right now if you let me have it. You'd have six good reasons. Well, Lord, I wouldn't do it. It's, it's 3, 3 a.m., Lord. Uh, uh, first of all, you might wake up some of the other people. And uh, 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 I mean, it ain't all that bad, Lord. I, can, I, 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 I will acknowledge the devil got his foot in the door, but I can cope with it. And we ought to say, Lord, save me now, <laughs> right now, right now. We got a saying down south, I love you right now. Uh, maybe I'm going to love you tomorrow. <laughs> I love you right now. Jesus said, Simon, do you love me? And on the third time around, old Simon says, Lord, I love you right now. You know I love you. And Jesus said, in that case, feed my sheep. And the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than a laser beam. And that Word is in your mouth already, on your tongue, the Word of faith. And you can speak it. Lord, thank you that you did not send us into the world uh, in darkness and ignorance, but in the light of your Word and the promise of your love. And you said that your ministry would be our ministry and that we would receive power when we made welcome the Holy Spirit to be your witness. And Lord, that is our desire for that is the need of our world, of our homes, our children and children's children. Dear Lord, let us set our face this night to walk in the light lest the darkness come upon us. Work your will and your ways in all that we are, precious Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Forgive us and cleanse us anew, day by day, breath by breath, and make us of your seed and your purposes. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. Be still and know that he is your God who sends his word with healing in its wings. Hallelujah. Take a deep breath. So is the spirit deep within you. 
make that gift of life free in your whole being. Hallelujah. Amen. And all the people said, Amen. 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 Turn and love somebody, two or three if you want to. Stand up. It's time for the nine o'clock prayer. Thank you for listening to this message from the CFO Classics Library. If you would like to listen to more messages from the library, please visit our website at cfoclassicslibrary.org. Or if you would like more information about the camps farthest out or would like to find a camp near you, please visit their website at cfonorthamerica.org.